first Paul wrote to identify uh, and provide solutions for spiritual problems within the church at Corinth. Uh, we find that in the first chapter, he addresses the sin of disunity. In the third chapter, he exposes the carnality within the church. In the fourth chapter, he deals with their judgmental attitude. In chapter five, he calls them out for their tolerance of immorality within the church. In chapter six, he rebukes them for resolving their differences by the world's means. In chapters eight through 10, he addresses self-focused offensive behavior within the church. In chapter 11, he straightens out their manner of partaking of the Lord's Supper. Chapter 14, he shows them how to correct their manner of worship. There are a lot of problems in the church at Corinth. As you can see, spiritual maturity was severely lacking and fleshly living was abounding. There was a substantial disconnect between what the church at Corinth was and what it could be or ought to be. In order for the church to uh, come to maturity, Paul understood and realized that there, was, there needed to be a great shift in thinking through the power of God's truth, and then a great shift in living that truth was needed through the power of what we see this morning, God's grace. And so to that point, Paul begins his letter by laying out the blueprint of God's plan to transform them into church filled with his glory. Follow along as we read verses four through nine. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Lord, we need uh, your help. Lord, we need you to illuminate our minds, to open our understanding, to shine the light of your word uh, upon our hearts. I pray, dear God, that our hearts would humbly receive it and obey it. I pray, Lord, that, um, Lord, that you would help us to see the, the riches and the power of your grace this morning. And that we would know and understand, Lord, how to appropriate that grace in our lives, Lord, for each day. We thank you for the privilege that we have to receive your grace. And uh, I pray that, Lord, this would be just a, a wonderful time in your word in which the Holy Spirit is free and able to do his work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to notice if, uh, uh, um, in verses four through nine, several different uh, things, but our, our, our main theme here this morning is the transforming grace of God. As we said, he takes the, the, he takes the entire letter, devotes the entire letter to dealing with, um, uh, to dealing with sinful issues within the church, but he begins here, he lays out the blueprint here at the very beginning of how God can and desires to transform uh, this church into a church that is filled with his glory. And the grace of God is key here. Because God's grace transforms. It changes. Never leaves anything the same. You and I who have experienced the saving grace of God know that that moment in which we by faith 
uh, uh, by grace through faith, received eternal life, our lives were forever changed. But he begins in verse four with what I call foundational understanding. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace which is given you by Jesus Christ. I'd like you to consider this morning the foundation of grace. This is his starting point for the letter, the grace of God. In fact, in verse three, as his custom was in the letters that he wrote, he wishes, he prays, he um, uh, beseeches that God's grace would be upon them. This is Paul's starting point as he prepares to bring much needed order to the body, to this body of believers. He shows them the most important component, which is the grace of God. Look at what he does uh, uh, because of the grace of God. Verse four, I thank my God always. Paul's testimony was that he perpetually thanked God for his grace on the behalf of of these believers. That phrase, on your behalf, shows his thankfulness for God's grace to be directly connected with God's grace for their lives and their church. I thank God, uh, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God. What made Paul thankful for God's grace on their behalf? Why was, God, why was Paul grateful that God's grace was available to these people? Well, the remaining five verses in our text this morning show him to be thankful for at least two characteristics of God's grace. Number one, there's a gratitude in Paul's heart to God for God's grace to the church at Corinth because it was available to them. It was available to them. What was the point of Paul's writing this letter to correct the mistakes, the sins within the church, the disorder and the disunity, if there were no grace to transform it, to change it? And so Paul is grateful for God's grace for the church at Corinth because it was available to them. But also he's thankful for God's grace to this church because it was applicable to them. It was sufficient. It was the thing that they needed to be transformed into a church that could be filled with God's glory. And so we see here the foundation of grace. It is the groundwork that Paul lays for any change that is going to take place through God's truth as he lays it out in this letter. Consider with me not just the foundation of grace, but consider the meaning of grace as well. What is grace? Well, there's been many uh, ways in which grace has been defined. And its most basic meaning, it is the gift of God's favor. And in God's favor, he provides to his people all of the resources that they need for their lives. At the cross, the gift of grace was in salvation, eternal life. And in the daily life of the believer, the gift of grace is in God's provision for every need. And so the grace of God is the gift of his favor and his resources to his people. In fact, the word gift that we, see trans, that, that we see in our English translation throughout the New Testament is often, uh, is often from a word with the same root as grace. It's God's gift. It's him giving his favor, his resources, and his resources, of course, are himself, right? It's Christ in you. So we see the foundation of grace. We see the meaning of grace. Consider, however, with me now the source of grace. Where does grace come from? Paul says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. There are two aspects to the source of grace, according to Paul. Number one, grace is God's to give. 
Grace is God's to give. There is no, uh, there is no grace outside of God. Grace is God's to give, and it is given by Christ Jesus. In other words, God is the source of grace, and Christ is the means of grace. I can't give you grace. Your friend can't give you grace. Your works can't provide grace for you. God is the source of grace. Christ is the means of grace. Christ is the head of the church. He is the one who imparts God's grace to his church. And Christ is the one who indwells our hearts by faith, is the one who imparts God's grace to our individual lives. And so we see the source of grace in God through Christ. Verse 4, the grace of God is given you by Jesus Christ. I'd like you to notice in verse 5, in abundant provision. In verse 5, he says, this grace is given you, verse 5, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge. There we see abundant provision. We can understand why Paul is so thankful for the grace of God for the church at Corinth. It is because he knows that it is the means by which they can be enriched in all things. Notice how he says it. This grace that comes from God through Jesus is given you so that in everything ye are enriched by him. What does it mean to be enriched? Exactly what it sounds like to be made wealthy. Paul is so thankful for the grace of God because he knows that the only way for them to be spiritually enriched in order for them to come to full maturity is by the grace of God. God's grace is the gold mine of all that the believer needs for spiritual change and righteous living. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, Paul writes, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things. Now, how is that possible? The grace. God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. See the abundant provision of God's grace? How about this? Ephesians 3, 7. Paul says, whereof, speaking of the gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. God's grace is his abundant provision to his people that in everything they would be enriched, they would be made wealthy, by him. And Paul says that God's abundant provision of grace is able to pro provide all that they need. In fact, we find in verse 7 that his goal is prayers that they come behind in no gift. In other words, that they not be lacking anything that's needed for them to come to full maturity for the glory of God. But he names two specific uh, needs in verse five. He says that God's grace will enrich them in everything, specifically though, in all utterance and in all knowledge. The word utterance there is simply the idea of speech or using words. God's grace, Paul says specifically, is for their speech and for their knowledge. He understood that their usefulness to God depended in large part upon having a biblical knowledge and effectively communicating 
that knowledge. In fact, he gives himself as, a, as an example in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 1 through 4, because he talks about how when he arrived in Corinth, he said, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In other words, Paul had the grace of God upon him. His speech and his knowledge was empowered by the grace of God. And that was the manner of Paul's ministry. The work of, uh, of the grace of God in him. Paul knew he needed God's grace. And he tells the Corinthians, you need God's grace in all utterance and in all knowledge. And God is able. He has given it to you. He's provided it for you. That in everything, you would be enriched. In other words, you would lack nothing that you need. That you would have the spiritual gold mine and riches that are found in Christ with God as the source. And so we see his thankfulness for the grace of God. We see the, the uh, foundational understanding of grace. And we see the abundant provision that it, uh, that it was for them. We see now in verse 6, the established testimony. He says, um, uh, uh, he, he says, the grace of God, it is given you by Jesus Christ that ye, then everything ye are enriched by him, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Here, Paul gives or he names the prerequisite of transforming grace in the life of the believer. He arkens back to their initial reception of the grace of God. When they called upon him and saving, uh, called upon God and saving faith, and he says, God, the, the testimony of Christ was confirmed. It was established in you. He's speaking of their salvation. The word testimony is the same as, is that the same as the word witness, which speaks to the idea of authentication. The testimony of Christ, the, authentic, the, the authentication of Christ in them. It happened. It took place, Paul says. At salvation, the person and work of Christ is stamped upon the believer's heart and thus begins the enriching work of God's grace in their lives. So we see that testimony of Christ, that established testimony in their lives that provided for them this wealth, this wellspring of grace in which Paul says would enrich them in everything by him. Verse 7, we see full usefulness. What does Paul expect? What does he desire for this church? What is his goal, his spiritual burden for them? It is that the grace of God would find them coming behind in no gift. Notice in verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, that idea of coming behind is simply the idea of lacking, right? But you wouldn't lack any gift. That word gift is, is tied to the same root word as grace. Just as the grace of God would provide utterance and knowledge specifically, verse 4, so it would provide all gifts that were needed within the church. We know as, you, as, we, as we get to chapter 12 in the book, we see Paul uh, addresses the idea of the gifts of grace within the church, the equipping that the Spirit does. By Jesus, it's all through grace. 
Just as speech and knowledge were gifts of God's grace, there are other gifts of grace that God bestows upon his people that he uses to build his church. The church was lacking, weren't they? Anytime there's division and disunity, anytime there's open, tolerated things like immorality within the church, anytime there's believers taking believers to court, anytime there are these kind of issues and sin, problems, carnality in the church, there's a severe lack of the gift of the grace of God in people's lives. And Paul's desire was that they would come to full usefulness, that the grace of God would enrich them uh, to the point that they would not lack any gift, that they would come behind in no gift. He wanted them to grow into spiritual maturity, and he shows here that spiritual maturity is evidenced in the full use of the gifts bestowed upon God's people by his grace. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, Peter made reference to this when he said, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The danger for the Corinthian believers and the danger for you and I who know Christ is that although we've received the gift of God's saving grace, we fail, uh, 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 although we've received the gift of God's saving grace, we fail to receive the gifts of what I would call God's serving grace. We're content with the grace of God that provided salvation. But we're discontented with the grace of God that provides power and strength. For a life that brings glory to God. That's the danger. To see God's grace as only for salvation and not for today. Not for this situation, that situation, that decision. And whatever, it, whatever it is that is a part of our life. It's not that God's gifts of grace are not available or given to us. It is that we fail to appropriate them to use them for his glory. When Paul says at the very outset here, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you. He's not speaking in terms of them living in the grace of God. He's not saying, wow, it's amazing to see the grace of God in your lives. Right? Because he spends the rest of the letter saying that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. No, 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 no. Grace of God wasn't operating properly in their lives. What Paul says when he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm so thankful that it's available to you because if it weren't, I just have to write you off. There'd be no hope. The danger is not that God's grace is not available to us. It's not, it's not that we can't help but lack God's grace. It's that we fail to appropriate God's, God's grace. It's there to enrich us in all things. But are we appropriating it? Paul makes reference to the time period of this grace in verse seven there, he says his desire is that they, that they not be lacking, that they come behind in no gift. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He makes reference to the time period of this grace, okay? Grace is for this waiting period that, that we're in. Grace is ours until the coming of Christ. That is the end point of God's work in us and through us. And so this life is a waiting period, but, 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 but it's not a passive thing, okay? Waiting in scripture is not a passive thing. 
It's not twiddling our spiritual thumbs. Waiting in scripture is an active thing. It's an active thing that has its crowning moment at Christ's coming. It is an active engagement in the grace of God and obedience to Christ. Until the day of his coming. So he says, as you wait, as you anticipate, as you eagerly expect and hope for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to be enriched in God's grace so that you, do, so that you don't miss out on any of God's gifts. Work of God's grace through the exercise of God's gifts in our lives is all pointed to the finish line of Christ's coming. Paul said in Philippians 3.20, for our conversation, our, 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 our real citizenship and, and uh, most meaningful living is in heaven. And once also we look 
sin, but he gives grace to those who humble themselves in broken confession. Many a believer has readily accepted the grace of God for salvation only to live a life refusing the grace of God for his transformational work in them. Where sin has been cleansed, the Spirit of God stands ready to impart the grace of God through the provision of Christ. And so I ask you again, do you have God's grace? In other words, are you appropriating God's grace for your every need? Are you enriched in him, in everything? Let's pray our Father. We, with Paul, thank you for the grace of God. Thank you for your provision, for all the spiritual resources that our lives need and require. I thank you, Lord, for the free nature of your grace. Lord, nothing required of us, but simply that we receive. I pray that you would humble our hearts where we are too hardened, where we are too proud, where we are too angry or bitter to receive your grace. To effect change in our lives. And Father, I pray that Lord, we'd walk out of here this morning with humble hearts and hopeful hearts that we can be changed by the grace of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I welcome you to stand with me. And as Noel plays a hymn of invitation, I invite you, encourage you to speak to God about that particular area or those particular areas in your, in your life that are problem areas, problems of sin and struggle, where the grace of God can heal, can cleanse, can transform.